This training was developed by the CU Department of Environmental Health and Safety, or EHS, and is intended for students in the biological and chemical teaching laboratories at CU Denver. Accidents and injuries are much more likely to happen in academic labs than in industrial labs. Why do you think this is? In general, people in academic labs are less experienced, wear less personal protective equipment, and have a higher turnover rate, which makes implementing training and enforcing regulation harder. Here is a list of recent accidents and injuries that have occurred in academic laboratories across the United States. There are many more accidents and injuries that were not reported on by the news or went unreported. The topics covered in today's training will help you prevent or properly react to accidents in the laboratory. Please follow all rules and procedures outlined in this training. After many recent accidents at CU Denver, the student or employee involved reported being tired or drowsy. So please come to lab well rested and ready to learn. Wear proper lab attire. Keep your lab door closed at all times. This is for both proper ventilation and security. Wash your hands frequently and follow proper procedures. Do not, under any circumstances, dispose of chemicals or biological agents down the drain. Be in the lab without a TA or professor. Bring food, drink, or cosmetics or anything else like that into the laboratory. Perform unauthorized experiments. Take anything that does not belong to you block emergency equipment or doors, and please act professionally. You will not be allowed to participate or be in the lab without proper lab attire. This consists of, but is not limited to, safety goggles, long pants or dresses that extend to your closed-toed shoes. There should be no visible skin in the ankle or foot region. You are not allowed to wear tight-fitting synthetic clothing such as spandex. Ladies and gentlemen with long hair need to tie their hair back so that it does not interfere with the experiment. Lab attire is at the discretion of TAs, teaching lab coordinators, professors, and environmental health and safety. If you have to argue that your lab attire is proper, then it is not and you will not be allowed to participate in the lab. The chemistry laboratory can be an interesting place it can also be a dangerous place if safety rules are ignored. Your school knows that safety is important, and so should you. These students are working in the laboratory without wearing their safety goggles. As you will see, this can be a very risky thing to do. Although you may be a very cautious worker, your neighbor may not be. Notice the student on the left is applying a strong flame to a test tube containing a liquid. Because the test tube is not being heated evenly and gently, and is also being carelessly held, the contents can easily be bumped from the test tube, perhaps into a neighbor's eyes. It is critical to get the victim to the eye wash station or a sink immediately. Because the eyes must be flushed thoroughly, it is necessary to keep the eyes pried open. You should report the incident to your instructor immediately. An open flame should never be present in the laboratory when flammable liquids are nearby. Such liquids can easily catch fire or even explode. A moment's carelessness is all that is required for a fire to start. If the fire should start in a glass container such as a beaker, put a solid object over the opening of the beaker. The fire will be smothered. 
It is crucial that you know where the fire extinguishers are located in your laboratory and how to use them. Never throw a lighted match in the trash. Should a fire break out, don't stand around and watch, but go immediately to the fire extinguisher, pull the pin out that keeps the trigger locked, remove the horn, aim it at the base of the fire, and squeeze the trigger slowly to avoid blasting the gas from the extinguisher. If the fire is truly out of control, sound the fire alarm. To avoid the possibility of your hair or clothing catching fire, wear snug fitting clothes and a hairnet to confine long hair. If your clothing should catch fire, do not run because this will cause the flames to spread and burn even hotter. Instead, immediately roll on the floor to smother the flames. Another person should get the fire blanket, a lab coat, or jacket to put around you to smother the flames. Cuts in the lab usually result from handling broken glassware. This student is using the properly designated receptacle to clean up a shattered beaker, but she forgot to use a dustpan and a brush. Like a burn, flush the wound under running cold water and call for assistance so that first aid can be administered. Any blood that has dripped onto the bench top or floor should be treated with a 10% bleach solution. Wait 10 minutes to ensure complete disinfectant action, then blot up the residue with a paper towel. Minor burns and spills are much more common in the lab. It's important to think about what you are doing at all times and not let yourself be distracted while working. Glassware and other lab equipment may look unremarkable, but may be very hot. If you should get a minor burn, flush the burn under running cold water for at least five minutes. As with glassware, please don't throw waste chemicals in the trash can or down the drain. Waste liquids must be discarded in the designated receptacle, and solid chemicals must be placed into the solid waste container. Some of the chemicals that you may be using in the lab are very caustic, such as concentrated sulfuric acid. You should never walk around with an open beaker containing a corrosive chemical. This is very dangerous. A moment's inattention or diversion can lead to a truly serious accident. In the event of a spill like this, go to the emergency shower, remove your clothing and dilute the acid. In a life-threatening situation, safety comes before modesty. When you are working with chemicals that give off vapors or bad odor, use the fume hood to protect yourself from exposure. Your work area should be clean and ready to use when you come to the laboratory. If it is not, clean the area before you start to work. After you have completed your experiments, return all items to their place, wash all glassware, and wipe down your bench top before leaving the laboratory. Common areas, such as around the balances, must also be cleaned up. Remember, the single most important thing you must do in the lab is to wear your safety goggles. If you wear contact lenses, put a sticker on the left side of the goggle so that in the event of an emergency, the people helping you will realize that you are wearing contacts. Always wear your safety goggles, not dangling from your neck, not covering your forehead, but over the most vulnerable part of your body, your eyes. Following these important rules will help to make your experience in the laboratory both safer and more enjoyable. In review, if you get a chemical or biological agent in your eyes, use the safety eye wash for no less than 15 minutes, remove contacts and glasses, and immediately seek medical treatment if necessary. For broken glass, use a dustpan and brush to clean up the broken glass and put it in the broken glass receptacle, not the trash can. Report all accidents and injuries, no matter how minor, to your TA or professor. This is not to get anyone in trouble. We want to try to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future and improve training or whatever we need to do to make sure that happens. If you have a chemical spill to a large section of your body, get under the safety shower, pull the handle down, remove all of your clothing, and wash for a minimum of 15 minutes. 
Your TA will get same-sex assistance to help you, and everyone else in the lab will leave to summon further help. A little embarrassment is better than chemical burns. Do not perform unauthorized experiments. Please follow your experimental procedure. Fume hoods are one of the most important safety features in a research laboratory. The hood is used to protect researchers from breathing hazardous airborne chemicals and the sash can be used for protective shielding. This presentation demonstrates how to use your fume hood properly to better protect yourself and our environment from exposure to hazardous materials. When you use the hood, you should turn on the hood light so you can see clearly. Check the hood certification sticker. It will list the date eh &S last checked the hood, the average inflow, and whether the airflow was satisfactory. One should always check the quantitative airflow monitor or alarm to verify that airflow for the fume hood is proper. There are two types of airflow monitors used on campus fume hoods, digital monitors and differential pressure gauges. Digital monitors display air velocity into the hood and should read more than 100 feet per minute. Differential pressure gauges measure the difference in air pressure between the room and the hood's exhaust duct in inches of water. The red indicator should be inside or above the circular target. If the hood airflow monitor indicates low airflow, contact your department safety coordinator, eh &S, or physical plant for maintenance. Airflow turbulence at the front edge of the hood can draw airborne contaminants out of the hood. In this case, the sash is too high, and when someone walks by, the low inflow velocity allows the smoke to come out of the fume hood. Adjust the sash to the proper height. In this case, the glass sash was raised to the maximum working height as indicated by the joined arrows, then slightly lowered. The tissue on the sash is drawn in, indicating that there is airflow into the hood. When the sash is lowered, the capture appears better, but when the velocity becomes too fast, research samples can be sucked up the hood duct. Sashes properly adjusted and working further into the hood are the best way to protect yourself from inhaling hazardous chemicals used in the hood. Move extra equipment out of your way and always work at least six inches in from the front of the hood. Some hoods have a combination sash that can be opened horizontally or vertically. In this case, the sash is lowered, then a horizontal sash is adjusted to provide protection from explosive reactions or chemical splashes. Typically, there are no pollution control devices on fume hoods. The airborne contaminants made in the laboratory hood are exhausted from the roof stack into the environment. Never evaporate chemical waste through a hood, and when working in the hood, minimize the volatiles released to protect our air quality. When you are done using volatile chemicals, close and seal the container. When finished using the hood, close the sash and turn off the light for added safety and to save energy. In review, before using the hood, check the airflow monitor. Properly adjust the sash height. Always work at least six inches in from the front of the hood. Fume hoods exhaust into the environment. Minimize your fume hood emissions. In closing, if you have questions about your fume hood, ask your lab manager, chemical hygiene officer, department safety coordinator, or contact the Office of Environment Health and Safety. In review, only ever put your hands and arms inside the chemical fume hood. Keep the sash at the lowest comfortable working height and never raise it above the maximum height indicator on the edge of the fume hood. Fume hoods are considered contaminated with chemicals and nothing other than the active experiment should be placed inside, including laboratory notebooks. Some of the lab spaces are hard to work around this, so please get creative and make the best of the situation. Before using a disposable glove, always ensure the right type is chosen for the type of work and potential hazards. Make sure the right size of glove is used. Measure your hand using a glove sizing chart. Wearing the right size will reduce the potential for tearing and also ensure freedom of movement for the hand. 
Remove any jewellery that may rip the gloves and wash your hands before donning gloves as well as after each glove change. To don, first select a glove from the dispenser and check for any visible tears and other defects. Gently open the glove at the cuff and insert the hand into the glove. Once the hand is inserted, move the fingers down into the glove's fingers to properly align it and ensure you have a snug fit all over. Roll the cuff of the glove down the wrist until the glove is secure. And now apply the same technique for the second glove. When removing, first grasp the outer edge near the wrist area. Fold it over and peel it away from the hand, turning it inside out as it goes. This will trap potential contaminants inside the used glove. Once the glove is off, hold it with the gloved hand. To remove the other glove, place the bare fingers inside the cuff without touching the glove's exterior. Now peel it off from the inside, turning it inside out as it goes and using it to envelop the other glove. Finally, discard them appropriately and never wash or reuse disposable gloves. Disposable nitrile gloves must be worn when working with chemicals that are toxic, corrosive, reactive or flammable. They must also be worn with biological materials that are considered hazardous such as infectious materials. Once you put on your gloves they are considered contaminated. You should not touch personal items such as cell phones, your lab notebook, or door handles, faucets, or anything like that wearing gloves. Do not reu reuse gloves. Dispose of them once you're done with them. If you notice a rip or hole in your gloves, remove them immediately and wash your hands using soap and water for a minimum of 20 seconds. Sing row, row, row your boat. And that's 20 seconds. Dry your hands with a paper towel. If you are generating chemical waste, there are several things you need to do to be in compliance with local, state, and federal regulations. The first thing to consider is if the chemical you want to dispose of is compatible with the bottle you are going to use to dispose of it. Also consider if the container you're going to use to dispose of the material was previously used for a different chemical or currently has waste in it. You need to label your container with the full chemical name written in English without abbreviations and estimating the concentration of the chemical in the solution. Do not fill containers more than 90% full and avoid splashing liquids onto the labels because it makes them illegible. Always use secondary containment and always keep the lid on tightly when you are not actively filling the container. It is very important not to mix chemicals if you do not know the type of waste that's already in the container or if the container was already used for something else. A common mistake made which you can see in the bottom right picture is when people use organic solvent bottles to put reactive waste into. They screw on the lid tightly, it off gases, the pressure builds up and it explodes. Please do not make this mistake. Our goal in lab safety is to prevent accidents and injuries 
or minimize their effects on people or our equipment. We can do this by following proper procedure, using secondary containment when storing or transporting chemicals, not mixing things such as chemicals if you don't know the reactivity of them, pouring slowly and carefully, and being in the moment, thinking about what you're doing in lab and nothing else. On the right is the accident pyramid, which shows that there are many at-risk behaviors, which result in many near misses, which is when an accident occurs, but uh, no one is injured and no, one, no property is destroyed. Of the near misses, some of them result in medical treatment and injuries. Some of the medical treatment result in people losing time in the lab, so they're so injured that they can't return to work or study. And of those, some are fatal. We are trying to be proactive by stopping at-risk behaviors. At-risk behaviors include breaking rules that we've been discussing, trying things that you have no knowledge about or are not qualified to do, failure to wear personal protective equipment, and of course fooling around and that sort of thing. We would rather be proactive than reactive. When there is a near miss or medical treatment is involved, please report the incident so that we can try to stop it from happening in the future. Although we try to prevent accidents and injuries from happening, sometimes they will happen. If you respond calmly and quickly following the procedures we were about to outline, you can minimize damage to the lab and prevent any more injury from happening. Let's point out some things in the room. First, where's the exit? Is there a secondary exit in case the first exit's blocked? Where's the closest fire alarm? Point to the emergency shower and eyewash. Do you remember how to use them? Point to the fire extinguisher. Only those trained to use a fire extinguisher may use fire extinguishers on small fires. In case of a large fire, evacuate the lab and pull the fire alarm on the way out. Where's your chemical spill kit? Similar to fire extinguishers, chemical spill kits should only be used by those who are trained and know what they're doing. Where's your lab's first aid kit? Directly outside your door is the house gas line shut off. If there's an accident in the lab, please shut off the gas as you exit the lab. Do you know where to go if you get injured? If there's an incident in the lab that requires evacuation, please calmly and quickly evacuate. Warn other labs as you leave the floor. Follow the directions for emergency exit in the hallways. And meet at the red X as a rally point for your lab. Stay at the red X until you are dismissed and make sure that your lab partner and everyone else you know in lab is there. If an emergency happens in your lab, your grade and the activity you're doing that day no longer matter. Your personal safety comes before everything. Accident and injuries will not affect your grade. Please report them to your TA immediately if you need help with a spill, please ask for help. If you are injured, there are many different situations that can happen. If it's severe, of course, notify your TA. Call the Auraria Campus Dispatch at 303-556-5000. Make sure you stay in the area to direct and greet responders if it's safe to do so. If you have a minor injury, notify your TA. You may seek the medical treatment of your choice. The health center at Auraria during normal business hours 
may be the closest option. After hours, Denver Health is the closest. Your lab partner or a volunteer from the lab must accompany you to your care. If there's a chemical or biological agent involved, send the safety data sheet or information on the biological agent with the person to medical care. First aid kits should be available in your lab and in the room SI3107. Please report all injuries and accidents to your lab manager, your instructor, your TA, and EHS will do their best to try to prevent future accidents from happening. If you have any safety concerns or would like to report an incident that happened in your lab, please talk with your TA, your professor, or lab coordinator. Additionally, you can contact the CU Denver Environmental Health and Safety representative, Ethan Martin, with incidents, safety concerns, or questions about laboratory safety. Again, none of these concerns or comments will be held against your grade or you. Please be like Milo and research safely. Thank you.